With characters like Casper the Friendly Ghost, Harvey Publishing and Cartoons was known as a kiddie line, but when the line started, its focus was on superheroes. Harvey Publishing appealed to a unique demographic of comic book readers. Harvey was known for Casper the Friendly Ghost, Baby Huey, and Richie Rich. They were a kiddie line serving the under seven crowd. The publisher, Alfred Harvey, was known around the comic book industry as Al the Kitty's Pal. The line didn't start off that way. In fact, they began with a heavy focus on superheroes, even having the team of Simon and Kirby creating for them. The Harvey publishing line began with Alfred Harvey, the son of Russian immigrants. Harvey was raised in the New York City borough of Brooklyn. And after graduating high school at age 14, he found work in advertising, drawing cartoons. Harvey's entry into the comic book industry happened at the very beginning of the Golden Age. He was hired as a manager by Victor Fox. The Fox studio was sort of a comic book sweatshop. There, Victor Fox would stand behind artists and yell at them to draw faster. Harvey left Fox Features to strike out on his own. And in 1941, he launched Pocket Comics, a digest-sized comic book. He also took over the Faltering Speed comics from Brookwood Publishing. And sales for both titles were not very rewarding. With the attack on Pearl Harbor, Alfred Harvey entered military service. And luckily, he was stationed stateside at the Pentagon in Washington, D.C. And this allowed Harvey to continue publishing. He brought in his brothers to help out with the day-to-day -day operations. Harvey's two titles struggled. The digest-sized pocket comics was an easy target for shoplifters. Kids could easily slip it in their pockets and walk out of candy stores undetected. Retailers didn't want the trouble. While on leave from the military, Harvey bumped into his old friend Joe Simon, who was also doing stateside duty with the U.S. Coast Guard. Before the war, Simon had been jumping from comic book publisher to comic book publisher, working for Novelty Press, Timely, and DC. Simon had maintained his connections around the comic book industry and offered Harvey help. His connections with printing houses, distributors, and comic creators turned Harvey's fortunes around. By the end of 1942, Harvey was establishing itself as a major comic book publisher. They found great success by licensing radio hero, The Green Hornet. The Green Hornet worked out so well that he began acquiring other intellectual properties like Joe Palooka, Blondie, and Dick Tracy. Success with these licensed characters would be a major part of the Harvey publishing plan for years to come. The Harvey line grew, and at times focusing on various genres. But first, the focus was on superheroes. So now, let's take a look at 10 Harvey Mask Avengers. By the way, these will be the original characters from the line and not licensed properties like the Green Hornet. Sorry, Green Hornet fans, we'll have to save that one for another video. Let's start off with Harvey's most popular superhero, or should I say superheroine? The Black Cat. She made her first appearance in the Digest Size Pocket Comics number one in 1941. She wasn't the first superheroine, but she predates most of her peers, including Wonder Woman. Linda Turner is a famous film actress working in Hollywood. Her father was a silent film star who would take her to the studio with him every day. She grew up around stuntmen and learned all sorts of things from riding motorcycles to martial arts. Her crime-fighting career begins when she suspects that the director of a film she's working on is actually a Nazi spy. She puts on the cat suit and begins to investigate as the Black Cat. After the failing of Pocket Comics, the Black Cat moved to Speed Comics, and after the war, she got her own title. Artist Al Gabriel created her, and later a 15-year-old Joe Kubert drew a few of her adventures but the artist most identified with the Black Cat is Lee Elias. Elias was an assistant to Milton Kniff on the Terry and the Pirates newspaper strip. Kniff's attention to detail had a huge influence on Elias's style, and that influence can be seen in Elias's art. 
The Black Cat was one of the most popular superheroines of the Golden Age of Comics. But like many Golden Age characters, she fell out of favor and by 1950 she was gone. Her title briefly changed into a western book and then it turned into a mystery horror book. Our next hero is Captain 3D. This book was a one-shot title that was trying to cash in on the 3D film craze of the early 1950s. And even though it was a one-shot title, there's a couple of reasons why this book is very important. First, he was created by the team of Joe Simon and Jack Kirby. You know, the guys that brought us Captain America. And second, if that wasn't enough to warrant recognition, this is also the first superhero work of Steve Ditko, and you might remember him for co-creating Spider-Man and Doctor Strange with Stan Lee. And in this book, it's Ditko's inks on Kirby's pencils. The Good Captain is the sole survivor of an advanced ancient civilization that was at war with the Cat People. And the story begins when a stranger enters the bookshop run by recently orphaned Danny Davis. The stranger gives him the book and tells him not to sell it. Suddenly, a second stranger enters the bookshop and shoots the first stranger with a ray gun. The second stranger begins to ransack the store, but Danny runs off, taking the strange book with him. Danny begins to examine the book. It contains special glasses to view it. When he puts them on and looks at a page, the amazing Captain 3D pops out. He tells Danny about how he was the chosen one by Professor Five. Professor Five was a super scientist trying to create a champion to defeat the Cat People. The experiment turned Captain 3D into a one-dimensional page in a book called The Book of D. His only way back into the three-dimensional world is for someone to look at the page he's on with special 3D glasses. Captain 3D takes Danny along on his adventures, and together they fight cat people and a cat-themed villainess named Tigra. Sadly, this character came and went, like the 3D film craze that swept the movie industry in the 1950s. Another superhero to come out of Pocket Comics number one is the Zebra. His story begins when convicted murderer John Doyle breaks out of prison just days before his execution. While on the run from the law, he proves he was framed and brings the real killer to justice. When he captures the real killer, he is wearing a striped prison shirt, and the press dub him the Zebra. The Zebra was the creation of Ellery King. Now, Ellery King is believed to be a pen name, which is derived from famous mystery writer Ellery Queen. As it turns out, no one knows who Ellery King was, but his name pops up on a number of early Harvey comics. Shock Gibson was one of those heroes created in Speed Comics when it was still under Brookwood Publishing. He made his first appearance in the very first issue of Speed Comics in 1939. The character's real name is Robert Gibson, and in the early stories he was called the Human Dynamo. Due to his ability to shoot electric bolts from his hands, and the fact that everybody knew who he was, he simply became known as Shock Gibson. Gibson started off as the cover feature of Speed Comics, but as other characters were added to the title, his stories got lost in the middle. He lasted in Speed Comics until 1947, and then was moved to the back pages of the Green Hornet until 1948. Another early superheroine is Pat Parker, War Nurse. At first her stories were drawn by Barbara Hull, but after she left, Jill Elgin took on the character until 1946. Initially, the series featured Pat Parker as an American nurse helping civilians in war-torn Europe. However, after a couple of adventures, Pat Parker dons a mask and costume and begins to directly fight Axis agents. One really interesting thing about Pat Parker Warners is that she forms an all-female team called the Girl Commandos. Many comic historians consider this to be the first all-female superhero team, and they were made up of an international roster of women with special skills. Another point of interest is that Pat Parker and the Girl Commandos 
played a major part in the one Harvey Heroes crossover story where they fought alongside the Black Cat, Captain Freedom, and Shock Gibson. Next is the costume duo of the Black Orchid and the Scarlet Nemesis. Well, they were kind of a duo, yet they were kind of not. They only appeared in one story in All New Short Story Comics number 2 in 1943, but this team up is rather interesting. Their alter egos, Rocky Ford and Judy Allen, both work for a detective agency, but neither is aware of the other's superhero persona. In their one story, the detectives witness a building fire. It's arson. And the two split up and don their costumes. The Scarlet Nemesis and the Black Orchid discover a wealthy madman and his goons are responsible. And together, they go into action to stop him. This story and the characters were the creation of George Tuska. He worked at the Eisner Iger Studios and worked for every major Golden Age publisher at one point or another. Years later, he worked at Marvel Comics, and he penciled or inked Incredible Hulk, X-Men, and The Submariner, but perhaps he's best remembered for his run on Iron Man, and on top of all that, he co-created Luke Cage. In the 1980s, he moved over to DC Comics, where he drew until his retirement. Altogether, his career as a comic book artist spanned over six decades. Now let's take a look at the Spirit of 76. Like many of the Harvey heroes, the Spirit of 76 made his debut in Pocket Comics No. 1. He is the creation of writer Joe Simon and artist Bob Powell. With the cancellation of Pocket Comics, the Spirit of 76 was moved over to fill out the pages of the Green Hornet. The tale of the Spirit of 76 begins when military cadet Gary Blakely finds the colonial uniform of his ancestor. He puts it on and magically becomes a superhero. In most of his adventures, he doesn't face the bad guys alone. He is surrounded by a colorful supporting cast of characters. And in these adventures, he always finds time for the ladies. Boom chicka wow wow! The Red Blazer, or as sometimes he was called, Captain Red Blazer, was Harvey's galactic superhero. He was the creation of Al Avison for Pocket Comics No. 1. Jack Dawson was riding a horse across Wyoming when he came across an alien spaceship crash site. A man calling himself Dr. Morgan is trying to bury a deceased alien pilot. Jack helps him, and afterward, Morgan offers him a drink of water. Jack drinks it and passes out. He wakes up to discover that he has been exposed to astropyro radiation. He then discovers that the radiation has given him superpowers. Early on, his stories appeared in sequential graphic form, which was typical of most comic books. But as time went on, more and more of his stories appeared in text form. By the time Harvey dropped superheroes in the late 1940s, the Red Blazer would only physically appear on covers and his stories were only presented in text form. Two months after Captain America made his debut, Captain Freedom made his first appearance in Speed Comics. His creator is unknown, but the obvious pseudonym Franklin Flagg appears on the early story art. The artist drawing the good Captain's early stories was Arturo Kazanov. He was from Argentina, and he came to the U.S. in the late 1930s. He found work drawing comic books and worked on characters like the Star Spangled Kid in Vigilante at DC, and he drew the flame for Fox Features. Captain Freedom's origin story was never told. His alter ego is newspaper publisher Don Wright, and in his adventures, he is aided by a group of kids who call themselves the Young Defenders. Captain Freedom usually fights Axis agents, and a few of them have colorful names like the Blitzer. The team of Joe Simon and Jack Kirby were one of the most dynamic duos working in comics during the Golden Age. And after Jack Kirby's return from the front lines of World War II, the duo teamed back up to create The Stuntman. The story of The Stuntman begins in the circus with a high-wire acrobat named Fred Drake. His friends own the circus, and when they refuse to sell to some shady characters, they die under tragic and mysterious circumstances. Drake begins investigating and discovers that someone else is also looking into the murders. That person is Hollywood star Don Daring, who also happens to be an aspiring private detective. 
Oddly enough, the two could pass for twins. They team up, solve the mystery, and bring the killers to justice. Afterwards, Derry invites Drake to join him in Hollywood as his personal stuntman. The two go on as a team, with Drake continuing to wear his circus acrobat costume. The duo play off each other, with the character Don Daring playing comic relief to Drake's stoic personality. Superheroes fell out of favor at the end of World War II, and Harvey had mixed results with their superheroes. The Black Cat was expanded and moved into her own title, and other heroes remained in publication, but sales for these books were in steady decline, and by 1949, all of their costume heroes had disappeared from the comic racks. One factor that hurt comic book publishers in general was that wartime rationing had come to an end and paper and printing became easier to acquire. This created a giant glut of comics competing against each other for shelf space. Harvey survived by moving into more trendy genres. They found success with romance, horror, and war titles, but they found their biggest success with the kiddie books. Starting in 1950, Harvey licensed the characters of Famous Studios. This was the animation arm of Paramount Studios, and this deal gave them characters like Casper the Friendly Ghost, Little Audrey, and Baby Huey. Famous Studios wasn't experiencing the same success as Disney and Warner Brothers animation, but the comics did sell, and this gave Harvey the ability to purchase the rights to these characters from Paramount in 1958. They repackaged the Paramount cartoons for television under the Harvey banner, and they remained in syndication for decades. As they moved into the 1960s, the Harvey line shifted almost entirely to little kids. Publisher Alfred Harvey began referring to himself as Al the Kitty's Pal. With the tidal wave of Batmania on TV and Marvel Comics doing really well on the newsstands, Harvey attempted a brief foray back into superheroes. It was a mixture of Golden Age reprints and campy new heroes. Needless to say, this attempt did not catch on. Harvey continued publishing until the 1980s. The line came to an end after a series of ownership changes and legal actions. Currently, the Kitty characters are under the ownership of Universal Studios and are handled by DreamWorks Animation. From time to time, Alfred Harvey's family will step back into the publishing ring and produce comic books and graphic novels. They usually reprint Harvey content from the 1940s and 50s. And that's the story of Harvey Comics. And I don't really have any personal memories about Harvey. Uh, they were around when I was a kid, but I don't remember ever reading them. When I was a real little kid, I do remember watching the Harvey cartoons on TV. Uh, and I remember seeing the uh, Jack in the Box logo at the end of the show. And other than that, I don't remember too much about it. I do remember a little bit about Casper. I remember not liking it. And there were mean ghosts in there that didn't like Casper because he was a friendly ghost and not a scary ghost. And Casper always seemed desperate to find acceptance. And as a cartoon, he just came off as sad and a little pathetic to me, even as a little kid. Yeah, I used to go to this uh, one drugstore uh, that had uh, two spinner racks. And one rack was dedicated to Marvel and DC. And the other rack was dedicated to everyone else. You know, the Charlton, Gold Key, Archie, and Harvey books. And by that time, I was well into superheroes, war, and uh, horror books. I do remember being sort of a comic book snob towards Harvey books because I thought they were aimed at little kids who were younger than me. And uh, I was in second, first or second grade, and there were kids who brought Harvey books to school. And I just remember looking down on them for having those books. Yeah, at school, I asked this one kid, uh, I think his name was Greg, and this was probably like first grade, something like that. And I asked him why he had a little dot comic book. And he told me that that was the only comic book his mom would buy for him. Yikes! I'm glad I didn't have his mom. Know what I mean? <laughs> As you can see, there are a lot of Harvey superheroes that I didn't cover in this video. I believe most of them are in public domain with the exception of the Black Cat, which the Harvey family still owns. And uh, Captain 3D and Stuntman are both owned by the Joe Simon estate. As for the 1960s characters, I have no idea what their copyright status is. My gut feeling is that they were forgotten about by the time the Harvey line sold in the 1980s, and there's no real clear ownership of these characters. 
Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please hit that like button and leave comments about your memories of Harvey Comics. I want you to know, even if I don't get a chance to respond, I do read every comment posted. And some of the stories out there are very heartwarming and I love reading them. Well, that's it for me. Thank you again for watching. Until next time, stay super. Bye.